things will head in a certain direction and it's going to happen. It's going to be slow moving beast. If you stay on that trajectory, you will, you will not have prosperity or your standard living will down. That's why we're paying attention to this stuff. That's why we're educating ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so we don't have that decline and we go up and we do better for ourselves. But I, I don't see cataclysm happening here and I'm crossing my fingers, obviously. Right. Um, but I think it's like they they know how to make it look like things are good. Um, the real cataclysm is going to be on an individual level with people that aren't able to keep up because they're going to let the inequality rise. And that's going to be I, – I, and what I was about to say is EBI, right? Like, yeah, right. So it's like – so that's the real and then war. It the, the war that's happening is happening in your bank account and at your job and with your, your retirement. And, and if you want to fight back, like that's why you have Bitcoin, you know? I met you last night. We went to some Bitcoin meetup and no one showed up. Yeah, it was, so, an, it was an aborted Bitcoin, Bitcoin meetup. I don't know what happened. Yeah, but, yeah very you know. bizarre, right? Because I had never seen that one. I mean, I, I live in San Diego. I, I know you're not from here, but I saw that and I was like, okay, let me go check this out. No one was there and the guy was closing shop. It was weird, yeah, right? But exactly. we ended up talking we are, and yeah. yeah, we went and, gra- went and grabbed a sandwich after. And um, yeah, so what I like to start off with is basically your origin story, right? For like, sure. How did you, what, when did you first hear about Bitcoin? When did it click? Um, were there any books that you read? Was there any aha moment? Totally. Yeah. Just kind of walk me through that. I mean, honestly, I feel like I think my, my journey is probably very similar to yours because we were kind of talking last night and you said you kind of got into Bitcoin close. You were a little bit earlier, I think, but, but you really dove into finance and just how the monetary system works in right around when COVID started. And that was Bro, so I, I work in the film industry. I'm a filmmaker, director, okay. um, do a lot of advertising, music videos, and stuff like that. And never wanted to even deal with finance, stocks. I thought it was just like I'll deal with that when I'm when I'm a big Hollywood director or like whatever, right? Like I did, I didn't, I just thought it was a waste of time to be honest. Same. And I was focused on creativity and all this other stuff, um, which I still am. But it, you know, COVID kind of just shattered my reality, honestly. And to be honest, like I lost my shit. You know, it's like I fucking like when they said that they're locking everything down for two weeks and one past two weeks, I was like, oh shit, man, like this is some worldwide World War Three type shit. And I started thinking about, okay, like, how am I going to pay my rent? Like they shut down my entire industry for a good eight months. Yeah. And I was literally like in limbo for the longest time. I have no other life skills other than making movies. Literally, it couldn't go work at McDonald's. They'd probably fire me. So like. I just started panicking and I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I got to figure out how to get rich. I got to figure out how to make money. I got to figure out how all this shit works. So I just like deep dove into finance in general. And I made a list. I remember sitting down in my room and making a list of like things to do research on. And on that list was stocks, finance, and then Bitcoin. And yeah, and that's how it started. I just went hardcore on YouTube, started watching videos, um, started dipping my toes into Robin Hood. Again, I feel like a lot of people went through this process just because COVID was such like a mind fuck. Um, it was like a shock, you know, to, it shattered my reality. Yeah, same, right? Like, because it was a situation where I don't want to like toot my own horn or say, you know, I I knew better than the average person, but, you know, I, I, I was scared too during that two-week period when like yeah. California shut down and yeah. no one was going outside and it was essential only and no one knew what was going on. You, you know, you didn't know what the real numbers were. People were on ventilators and they were dying. For sure, yeah. And, but then after, you know, after I started looking at the numbers, I was like, okay. Um, and then I looked at the, the, the flu numbers and there were like no cases of flu. Um, I'm not saying that COVID was the flu. It's just, it was a very bizarre time and you know, tinfoil hat, Ryan thinks that there was something else going on there. Cause, cause I, I think, I think the bottom like, line is, is that like all bets are off the table now and the world that we used to live in does not exist anymore. Yes. And we, we cross this line. We like literally our movie jumped the shark. Right. So w- once that happens, you start looking at other stuff. Um, and even like, dude, I had a real estate situation going on during COVID and then you couldn't evict people. My, my tenants were not paying rent. So now I'm on the hook for all this money. I can't kick them out. I mean, they were my friends too, so it was weird. But like I, some one of them paid, but you know what I mean. Like, sure, it was just not good. So it was like, regardless of like what happened and how it happened, it happened. And yeah, I deep dove into finance, learned about finance. It took a while. Um, 
but I literally put in like put in the thousand hours of just watching all these videos. And while that was happening, while I was doing the Bitcoin stuff, I see this video with this dude called Michael Saylor. And he's talking to Robert Breedlove, who I'm sure you know and all your audience knows. And they were going deep, man, like in a big, like literally two hour long sessions, but like multiple sessions talking about Bitcoin, how it works, yeah. how how it's a store of energy and value, um, how money works. You know, like I, I really was starting to understand what money was on a deeper level and not just, and then you start learning about how the Fed works, how inflation works. Dude, again, this is stuff that I never even thought about, didn't want to think about, didn't care. Same. Because before inflation was like 2% or it like wasn't, it was negligible. Yeah. And then you see what happened during COVID. And then again, I'm learning about all this stuff and I'm trying to tell people about it and they think I'm fucking crazy. So, so yeah, I just got super into it. And then I started, you know, again, dipping my toes. Um, the first crypto related purchase I made was MicroStrategy stock. Um, and then again, I bought a cold storage wallet. I started getting on the exchanges. I started, and then as this is happening, I literally see Michael Saylor put his entire net worth of him and Bitcoin, or sorry, Bitcoin and MicroStrategy into Bitcoin. And I'm like, okay. And then I look at who he is. And I'm like, okay, this dude's smart. This guy's a billionaire already. And he also predicted the mobile mobile technology revolution, mobile phone revolution, wrote that book about it, whatever it's called. The mobile wave, yep. And I just listened to him talking. I'm like, this guy went to MIT. He's really smart. I should probably listen to this guy. And that gave me a lot of credibility too. And then I saw this stuff that happened with Elon. When I, I think he tweeted Elon and Elon put a bunch of money. To, that's a whole different fiasco because I think Elon was playing a little fast and loose. But but yeah, man, like that's what really got me super, super into it. And then I just went down a rabbit hole. And as this thing's happening again, it's playing out not only like from a knowledge standpoint, but like from a, from a price point standpoint, as I'm like doing this, like the price of Bitcoin just keeps on. I'm like, look, dude, the, what's the price of Bitcoin today? It's I think around 51 K. I think right? it's around 51. Yeah. Yeah. And like, let's just look at this year. Like if we bought it in like January or not even like, or sorry, like end of last year or something, it was significantly lower. So like a, it moves really fast. Um, and yeah, you just see it playing out in front of you like live in front of your eyes and you're like okay this shit's this is this train is taking off so i just got a lot of enthusiasm um started yeah. accumulating it um started learning about the markets and yeah and it's, it's it's like there's no going back so so we had talked a little bit and and i had given you some pushback on kind of market cycles and sure, strategy sure, sure. right because i'm more of a you know long-term kind of mindset versus trying to trade the cycles. Cause I'm pretty sure. sure I won't be able to time that. Yeah. 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 And you, you kind of have more of an idea of you, you'll, you'll have, a, you'll have some kind of indicators. Um, so like, what is your plan? What is like, what for indicators sure. are you looking for? Well, you know, I think, I think the first thing is like, look, I'm not a, a finance expert, you know, this is not financial advice, whatever. That's what the t-shirt says, right? Like that, you know, but it's just like, the bottom line is that like last time, and I'll be the first to admit it, I got over exuberant with Bitcoin too, just like everyone else. Sure. And I bought 10K at the top, pretty close to the top. Now I bought more than that before on the way up. And as it went down, I kept on buying. So like it evens out obviously, mm -hmm. but you kind of realize that like, you know, yes, you can hodl and like over the long term, that's obviously gonna work. You can obviously, like if you're just, have you been hot? You said you started accumulating early i don't even remember but it was like it was like the past the last cycle right uh yeah it was so, it was it was right like right at when it dropped down to 30 the first time i started accumulating 17 or like 18 when it no when it dropped when it went up to like 65 down to 30 sure i did a uh you know bulk buy and then okay. i started dcaing and i've yeah, just yeah, been yeah. dcaing ever since yeah so you you got a you got a pretty good entry point and it's it's paying off well i think it's like but if you've been through a few of these cycles and you look at the actual historical cycle and how there's bull runs and then there's there's bear markets or whatever, sure, um, Bitcoin winter, whatever you want to call it, like um, it's almost it's kind of predictable. There are cycles. You can do it based off having. You can do it based off bigger macroeconomic picture. What the Fed's doing, you know, what happened with COVID. Like you see the the plumbing of the system. There's a war. Yeah. 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 So it's big, like big big indicators. Yeah. There there are a lot of bigger picture things, and I don't think it's about calling the top or getting it right. I think it's about if you want to, you know, really get good at this wealth building thing, you need to build those muscles. And we're in a perfect time to to uh, 
do some lifting. You know, it's like we know that the Fed's going to launch it. They, they literally said it. They're going to do it this summer sometime. There's an election coming up. They have to do it before then. Otherwise, the, the election's over. So so that it's going to happen. It's a certainty. And the last time they lowered interest rates. Now, are they going to go down to zero? Maybe not. But even if you know what happens when they, you know what I mean? Assets go up, yeah. Yeah, like easy monetary policy, right? So assets will go up. It doesn't, you can you can do this outside of Bitcoin. Don't get me wrong, right? Like I could buy Meta stock. I could buy any tech stock. You could do this with, people do this with real estate. It's a little bit more slow moving, but like you could do it with like a bunch of other things. So it doesn't have to be with Bitcoin. You could buy altcoins, whatever. I know that's probably sacrilege with Bitcoiners, but you know you know what I'm saying, right? Like there, there's definitely a lot outlets to do this so it's not particularly about my bitcoin holding per se but it's about like we are undergoing these these very very loose monetary policy times and it's only gonna get worse and we can talk about also origin wise in terms of like where half of my family is from south america yeah i, I would love to hear about that actually. and and yeah and it's like this is just, like we you need to learn how to do stuff just to keep up this isn't even about getting rich now. This is just to not fall behind because the wealth divide is just getting bigger and big. I see it everywhere. It's, there's the haves and have nots. Especially in California. You yeah. See it and, and in places like this. Yeah. So it's like, it's only going to get worse. And this idea of that you can save your way to wealth is over. Sorry. Like that just doesn't work, especially with what they're doing. They're, they're, like like this money printing is a um, taxation without consent. Yeah. It's theft. Yeah. So when the, when the government does it, it's right. It's not that, but if, yeah, it's counterfeiting basically, but they're basically taxing you without your permission. And, and yeah, and it's like, they don't care if you're in the upper bracket or the lower bracket. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is why it's so insidious is that normally, you know, this happens throughout a lifetime, right? So yes. maybe you might go through a hiccup like 08, 09, where there's a ton of, ton of money printed or COVID most recently. Sure. Yeah. Um, but it's for a lot of people, it's just, it's, it's just like a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a slow print over time. And they can, you know, they, if they stay in the same job and they get their little one to 2% raises every year, inflation is not stable at 1%. I think Saylor actually, he's claimed through his um, analysis of, asset prices rather than like the cost of bananas yeah. or whatever yeah, yeah. that it's averaging about seven percent for well, the last dude, the cpi you know, is a few the cpi is a lie right cpi yeah. like they they've been changing the criteria and kind of playing the shell game with it and the fed's very smart and they've been they're all the numbers you're getting from the, the government like are manipulated numbers they literally re-revised job numbers a couple months later so it's like this is all a lot of smoke and mirrors and like most yeah. people don't have the time to look into it i don't blame them but the bottom line is like, look, you're going to fall behind un unless you get very strong financial literacy and not only, not only the literacy, but you're developing the muscles to operate in that environment because you know what? That's the language that wealthy people speak. They, that's how they operate. You see them with their businesses. You see them, how they, people, how they do real estate. You see them how like they, they understand the language of money. And I think it's imperative that everyone else does as well, just so they can, continue to keep their standard of living and also honestly so they can become wealthy as well and, and and you know even the playing field absolutely and and that's the beautiful thing about bitcoin is that it's a decentralized nation state resistant store of wealth right and almost everything else is not with the exception of gold but that's kind of been papered over but even real estate right there's there's a lot of talk about real estate and you know how maybe you should allocate you know 10 20 percent of your portfolio to bitcoin because there's really no counterparty risk right yeah i In mean it's, it's the COVID so it's, thing right like yeah. my tenants had a had a open-ended free rent that lasted i mean i think it ended up lasting almost a year where you can evict anyone and they didn't have to pay so crazy, if you're dude. a big corporation that's fine right you can just go to the markets but if you're a small landlord i guarantee you that a bunch of small landlords had to sell and get out of their thing because there's like, I can't Especially cover in California. With, yeah. With I can't the, cover the these moratorium. mortgages. Right. It, the, the moratorium lasted almost like two years. Yeah, something. exactly. That's what I'm saying. So it's like, imagine now that's on the table. Now that there's a precedent for that happening. Um, imagine if there's another, whatever, right. And you're doing your, you put all your net worth into real estate and you're renting out to a tenant. And this, this tenant just happens to be someone that decides they don't want to pay or can't afford it. And you have to cover it. If you're not somebody that has deep pockets, like you're SOL and you have to sell the place. And also, um, 
you know, I was listening to Preston Pish. He's he's one of my favorite Bitcoiners. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not. I've not heard him. No. He does like the Billionaires podcast. I would definitely check it out. Oh, I listened to that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I've he was saying he he did you know he ran the numbers or I don't know maybe saw it on Twitter or something. But basically, in the last four years, with the house prices going up roughly forty percent, sure, and the interest rates going from zero to you know six seven percent, right? Yeah. Or 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 two to three to six to seven. Over the year, over the time span of 30 years throughout your mortgage, you're paying like, I think it, what did he say? I think it was like twice or it, it was more than twice the amount with all the interest lumped in and the rise in prices. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane, right? Yeah. So that's so much risk. Yeah. It's a lot of risk. And I think it's like, look, if you're good at real estate and you're good at that game, you can make money. Don't get me wrong. But the majority of people are not doing it that way. They are just buying their primary residence taking on a big mortgage, paying a lot of interest, not paying it down early, not using the capital to go invest in new properties and and you know, raise the value of it so that they can rate have a have a high rent tenant. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you got to know what you're doing to, to do this stuff. And again, you you still have this wild card in the back of your head that like if there is another god forbid like whatever disease or whatever it is and they start doing another moratorium, you may have to cover the cost. So if you don't have that money set aside like runway you could be screwed so that that's that's something that i always have to have now in the back of my head if i'm looking at doing real estate stuff because it's like you got to have the money set aside otherwise you have to have a backup plan for that stuff whereas if i buy bitcoin that's you can liquidate that right away if you need to you can literally take take your keywords you don't even have to take take the the cold storage just remember your seed phrases and go to another country yep you know what i mean so it's like there's no other asset that's able to do that um, even gold, like you, you only can bring what you can carry on you. And like, they're going to, they're going to do the metal detector on you when you go to the airport. Yep. Um, they can't take what's in here, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and so you had mentioned you have a family history of monetary debasement in another country. Yeah. Yeah. So can you get into that? Cause that's, cause I'm really sure. interested in that. I'm yeah. actually going to be giving you some, some nice, uh, some Venezuelan boulevards here. Uh, well, that's, that ties in perfectly. Okay. So yeah, man, like my fam, my, my mother's side of family is from Venezuela. Um, about in the two thousands, they had a Hugo Chavez who was a, who was a, um, you know, dictator or whatever elected got a, he got elected democratically, but it was, he was, it was running on a, a very socialistic leaning policy, right? Wealth redistribution. Um, and then once that happened, once he got into office, they just started debasing the currency. Inflation shot up, went rampant, and then the standard of living in the country just went down through the basement. And um, the society just started collapsing. So what ended up happening is that it became very violent, very dangerous. There were shortages on um, goods, consumer goods and food and all that stuff. Um, people started getting violent over that stuff. People started having to buy basic necessities through the black market because all the stores were out. So you're, you're getting basically this because, whole... Because yeah, yeah. they were doing price controls, right? Exactly. That's what exactly I was going to get into. This is the stuff that happened when the 70s with the gas, right? And the stuff they're trying to propose you know, here. And it just doesn't work because you, if you don't understand how this money stuff works, it sounds good on paper, right? You're like, yeah, we're just... Well, those greedy corporations will just not make right just like but biden you know, said right yeah you but know, you, you, get those, you know those, the thing Oreos. is <laughs> yeah it sounds good and if you don't know what you're talking if you don't know what you're talking about it sounds good and i don't fault people for thinking it works but i think like if you actually look at what has happened what will happen is that someone's just going to buy up all the inventory and they're going to sell on the black market and then they're going to jack the price stuff even more and then everyone else is going to be screwed or, or there's going to be some sort of queue system where like only the people that have that are friends with the people in charge get to buy it. Yep. And so you're just running into the same problems that happened in a lot of communist countries and whatever. Um, but that's what happened there. So as a result, yeah, there's a huge, uh, there's obviously a lot of issues of immigration happening now. A lot of refugees um, from Venezuela and other countries have been coming to the States because of that, because it's like they, they don't have a choice and things are really bad there. So it's yeah. like the same things happened in Argentina, you know, talk about that for days. So there's like a, there's a track record of this kind of stuff happening, especially in South America. Um, and I think like if you're from one of those countries, understanding Bitcoin and why it's important is going to be a lot easier because you've seen the worst case scenario. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember seeing um, a documentary on Venezuela and, you know, like all of the grocery stores were empty. Right. And because and guess when that happened here. Yeah. COVID. Yeah. Right. So, you know what I mean? Like that's that it's it's 
all this stuff just sounded like nutty before until it actually happened and it started happening. And then you see, okay, this is within the realm of possibility. I'm not saying it's going to happen here, but if you want to protect yourself against it happening, then maybe look into alternatives, alternative systems like Bitcoin. Yeah. Whatever. No, yeah. Grow your own food, whatever it is. Right. Like it's just like, you just have to realize that like the system may not be as stable as you think it is. So, and correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not a, you know, I have the, the Venezuelan boulevards here, but I'm not an expert on the situation in Venezuela. And they, so they, they took over oil production and there was also, I heard something about mining. Sure. So they, they banned Bitcoin mining, right? And didn't the government take that over as well? I mean, like, look, the, th the thing is like all the industries there got nationalized and I think oil was nationalized for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but the bottom line is like when, once they had that regime in place that led to what's going on now, not only did they, did the monetary systems collapse, but they kind of became at odds with the United States. So there's kind of a, um, they kind of got kicked out of the Western system interacting with them. So then there's no market for their oil, right? So that caused some problems as well. And I, I do believe that um, as a result of that, they en ended up starting opening up relations with, you know, the enemies of the US, like Iran, China, mm -hmm. Russia, whatever, right? So it's kind of like you have um, nationalization of all these industries. And, and and the country like was so wealthy before that. And it was that's, all, yeah, that's, it that's, was that's all the oil, right? The oil, it's literally like Dubai. Uh, in South America, they they had so much money, so much oil, and so much wealth, and like same thing with Argentina, and I think it's like once that happened and there was that schism, they kind of broke off from the system. They 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 can't survive under a capitalistic system where they're they're actually transacting goods and stuff, and it's just like it all just fell apart. Yeah, I mean, government regulation will strangle the people to death. And I mean, it just, it just will. Right. And, and we're already starting to see that in the U S a little bit, I think more so in Europe. Um, but have you been following what's going on in El Salvador? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so what do you think that, what, what do you think about that? I mean, it looks really promising. I've, I've, you know, I've actually, I was actually speaking to some people that went down to one of the conferences down there and they said, everything looks good. It looks amazing. A lot of cool people going down there, a lot of investment. They clean up the crime. Um, the country's GDP is going up. Yeah. He looks like a genius. Um, time will tell, right? Like, I think it's like, I know that like people like Max Kaiser and whatever, like went down there and they're very early adopters of, of, um, Rukele, no, no worries. And, um, so it's, it, it looks all very promising. Um, but again, it's like, if you're buying into that system of Bitcoin, which is a new system, there's, is also always a threat of the old system trying to counteract it or stop you especially if it's being operated on on a nationalistic level right so who know who knows what's gonna happen but uh, like he looks like a genius yeah he's like sailor right they look they both like sailor looks like a genius he just went from one billion and change to i think there were 10 like, billion yeah now yeah. dude's a genius like so and because i i like to kind of compare bukele to i forgot his name the president that brought up uh singapore in you know the the 80s up until the present right basically opened up all the markets sure. lowered all the taxes yeah. eliminated crime to a very aggressive degree right i mean if you steal something you get your hand chopped sure. off or something yeah yeah it's a little little crazy but you have to do what you won't have to do if if uh you, <clears throat> you need to clean up your economy and really make massive change sure. in order to move forward and provide you know opportunities for your people and there's like the liberal side of me says oh you know human rights but then the other side of me says well would you rather have, you know, some dictator running the country and crime running all over the place and having to pay people, you know, basically the mafia, which is MS-13 down there, sure. um, vigs for protection and all these sorts of things. And your, your kids are getting recruited into crime in into gangs. And, you know, it's one of the highest murder rates in the nation. And now it's like, I think it, they're second, I think second or third per capita murders uh, in, you know, South central and North America. It's amazing. Right. And, um, I'm curious to see what happens with Costa Rica. Cause I know that there's some stuff going on sure. there. Um, there's a lot of expats there as, as, as well from the U S and geopolitically, it makes me wonder about the canal 
right? Because that's recently kind of been controlled by China. There's there's actually military personnel sure. down there. That's that's a huge strategic um, entry point for the whole west side of North, Central, and South America sure. for for trade. And I wonder if Bitcoin's going to play a part in that, right? So it's it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think like look, um, he's. I don't know what he did to clean it up. I'm not, I haven't looked into it, but like, <clears throat> it seems like it's working. Um, I think that there's a history of a lot of, you know, crime down there and, 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 uh, you know, cartels and all this stuff. I do think that one of the things, if you want to talk about South American politics and history is that like, yeah. it's, it's always kind of been the, the, the middle ground battleground for all these other bigger, bigger powers. El so Salvador has all these countries. Oh, I mean, I've you seen, oh, yeah, have yeah. you seen the Oliver yeah. Stone film El Salvador? Like, I haven't. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm, the United changes. States is like a very long history of doing regime change in these countries and just kind of like installing new regimes, right? So you have to be like on guard for that if you're down there because like they're going to exert their influence and and change regimes, and this happens in a lot of countries, right? So so yeah, I mean, I think it looks good. I hope he's protected and has the right intentions and yeah and like in costa rica same thing look the thing is like the the beautiful thing about it is we don't have to worry about it because bitcoin doesn't have borders yeah yeah you and know? that's and, and and that's one of the beautiful things like you say you can just have your keys in your head and you know hop on the plane and no one's no one's the wiser right yeah um so you know we were also talking so i i also wanted to get your take on like what you think about elon musk because sure. i know that you, you've done a lot of research in that area for sure um He's a very polarizing figure. He wants to put chips in people's brains. He's yeah. for freedom of speech. I, I wouldn't like, I don't think he's a, he's a, he's a big, a true Bitcoiner. I don't Not think either. he's like a Bitcoin, Bitcoin maxi. I think if you look at what happened during the bull run, what Tesla did, they bought a significant amount of Bitcoin, like over a billion, right? I think like one point something, 1.2, 1. Like 1.6, whatever. He sold off most of it, but he still has some. Um, and then he went on SNL. And at the height of the bull, like literally at the height of the mania, right? And then, and then like Bitcoin tanked after that. Literally, like it was almost coincided. So I think he was kind of like trying to appropriate Bitcoin for himself and like pretend like he's in charge of making Bitcoin go up and down. When really, and this is a trick that they do a lot in um, in the media and finance as well. They'll like they'll kind of see a wave that's already coming in, and they'll pretend to like they'll surf the wave and then act like they caused the wave. You know what I mean? And it's kind of a way to appropriate. Um, a trend and act like you're the cause of it so that next time you do something the trend follows it mm. it's i think that's what he was doing and also he's just a clout chaser right he's always looking for for new ways to build his audience so my theory is that he kind of kind of just kind of just dabbled with it and then like and also when he did that he probably got his hand slapped by all the other all the old school money right and they're just like no 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 no, no you don't do that and where does he get his bread buttered right like you know he's he has contracts with with the military and all this other stuff for SpaceX and he's doing all this, all these green credits for Tesla. So it's like, I think he kind of flirted with it and just didn't really. And also he's like homies with Jack, right? So Jack seems like a legit Bitcoiner based off what he's been doing. Um, but again, he says such a high level echelon. You don't know what his motivations are. Like those guys are all billionaires. Yeah. Um, unless he does what Sailor did. I don't, you know, like, like Sailor went, like he went all in. He didn't just go all in. He went all in and then he took on debt. <laughs> like he he's crazy. So it's like I haven't seen anyone else do that. I think I think Jack Dorsey's Square or whatever block whatever it is. They have they're pretty invested in Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. Like PayPal. A lot, a lot of these fintech companies are. And he he's doing a bunch of different initiatives with like you know TBD and yeah. So it know, seems like his it seems that. like his his intentions are good. But again, like I don't know. I haven't looked into it. But I think that that was also the influence on Elon Musk. Is that like he's friends with Jack Dorsey. Sailor did tweet him. I remember that happening. And then he bought some. So maybe, maybe he's, yeah, I don't know. I think he was just trying to ride the wave. But so we also talked about this last night is, you know, Peter Thiel's uh, 2022 Bitcoin speech. He starts out talking about how PayPal, the original business plan that he showed sure, in his sure, presentation sure, yeah. is that they were trying to create sound money and go up against fiat. Really? Yes, yes. And they weren't able to do that. The powers that be kind of shut them down and they, they figured it would be way too much, you know, regulation, red tape, you name it, um, going against the banking lobby. So they decided to integrate their product into sure. the financial rails. Now, 
it's clear to me that Peter Thiel is a hardcore libertarian, which I aligns with Bitcoin ideals. They're both tied into the military industrial complex and a number of other industries sure. and investments, you name it. So, I mean, tinfoil hat on, right? Like, what do you think? Do you, do you think they're going to try to leverage Bitcoin um, as maybe like a defensive weapon or utilize it to disrupt the banking industry? Because, I mean, also, <clears throat> Peter Thiel just purchased, I think, not Cointelegraph, but the other one, one of the major news outlets sure. uh, for crypto. They, they purchased it from DCG so they can put their own propaganda out there, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. It's like these are all speculations at this point. Yeah. Um, you can look at you can take a bunch of different angles on how you think these guys are operating. You could say like, oh, they're just trying to get rich off themselves. You can say they're involved with the government and maybe this whole thing was a plan. Like, look, the, a lot of the policy, the monetary policy that's going on right now is not in the best interest of the United States. Correct. To a certain degree. Um, and you can say, yes, the, the, you, there's, there's always two ways to look at the world, right? There's um, everyone's an idiot and there's, it, there's no one's in charge. And there are some smart people that know what they're doing and they're just playing dumb or playing possum or whatever. If I were going to go with the possum idea, then there's a possibility that hey, maybe maybe United States was involved with Bitcoins because they saw the writing on the wall with fiat and they knew that it would eventually come to an end. You have a rise of China and dominance of, of you know foreign powers, uh, multipolar world order. And maybe they're like, well, what if we create something that's the antithesis of fiat? Um, everyone's going to pour their energy into it. And if we secretly control it, then, you know, that would give us the upper hand. That's a potential possibility. There's obviously no proof of any of this stuff. The thing with the Thiel and the PayPal, it's just weird. You can literally go and look up a video of Peter Thiel talking about when they started PayPal. And this is like in 2006, like early 2000s before financial crisis. And they're talking about how there needs to be a um, digital way to transmit money. It, it all, and this was like with the inception of PayPal, but it sounds very similar to what it sounds like proto Bitcoin almost, right? Um, and he's literally like, we need money that's outside of the purview of nation states. Like he, all, it's all there. Like the way he talks about it. So maybe he was involved in it. I know that he was also he he gave a grant to uh, Vitalik for Ethereum. The guy that started Ethereum, he literally he won one of those Peter Thiel grants. I didn't know that. Straight out of high school. Oh, really? Yeah, like dropped out of college type thing, right? Okay. So so he has a hand in that. That's also, right? That's interesting. So I don't know. You know, I don't, you, you don't, you'll, don't, we'll never know probably, right? But it's just like, I don't know. I, the way that I look at Bitcoin is that like, look, you, the way you just, the way things are going right now, you already don't have a choice if you just stay in what's going on. You're going to, you're going to, you're, you're screwed if you just stick with the status quo. 60 40 portfolio <laughs> yeah like buying bonds now dude yeah well i mean like like bond the 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 um the rates on bonds this past year were amazing right mm. so it's like but but the point is, is just like yeah this this whole like old way of of conservative investing um just it, you know the traditional finance thing like it's slowly falling apart so your choice is either to you know figure it out figure out this new thing or just get rich starting a business like what are your other you know there aren't very many other options um so you have to at the very least learn about it and then also treat bitcoin as a financial vehicle to wealth now if you want to start getting down to the nitty-gritty and whether like it's um in, impenetrable and like doesn't have vulnerabilities from attack and like that's a different story right that requires a lot of research and also a little bit of faith right because you never there's always gonna be a black swan for everything right so but i think it's like you don't have a choice not to at least look into this and learn about it because if you just stick with the, what's what they're telling you to do like you're gonna get screwed yeah that's that that's what i try to tell people and again that's why i'm doing this podcast is to educate people because in this current environment you have to do your own research yes you can have a good financial advisor but um they're looking for fees that's it they don't yeah, yeah and I, I think fees. there's a lot of good financial advisors <laughs> out there that that are that are looking out for their clients but at the same time i mean you can't be ignorant to the world around you anymore Right. You can't just invest in the S&P and kind of float bonds. And, you know, because when you look at the last 50 years, this has been like one of the largest bull runs ever. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this has been the USA just like dominating the world for decades. Right. And that's I, I I think that might be coming to an end. I don't think abruptly, but I think probably over the next couple of decades as AI comes into the play and you have the chip war going on and you have 
other technologically advanced nations that are competing um, at a higher level with the U.S. than per se around two, 2001, 2002 time, right? Where sure. we just dominated the whole dot-com internet, e-commerce, you name it, right? That was that was like yep. 99% um, U.S. companies, really. Yeah. And then China kind of walled their, walled their citizens off and created their own products based on ours. But... Um, Right now, China's building their own models, and they have great models. They and they have tons of data, right? For sure. They're 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 pulling in tons of facial recognition and tons of data. I mean, all the data through TikTok, right? It's it's going to be an interesting world because what I see, I, I was thinking about this a couple of weeks ago. <sighs> data, right? Like, there might be a situation where there's there there starts to be like regulation or guardrails put around a country's data. Because the U.S. is just sucking in the entire world's data and using sure. it to build these super models yeah. that are going to put everyone out of business and kind of automate all these simple tasks. Sure. So if if I'm on the other side of that, if I'm like a BRICS nation or something, I'm thinking, okay, well, hmm, if data is the gold and I need to build my models and I'm not going to have full access to the best, you know, open AI or classified models, whatever they have, mm -hmm. I need to start maybe putting some put, putting some guardrails around this and protecting my citizens. So I don't. I mean, basically, it's just kind of deglobalization. I guess is what it is, right? Sure, sure. So yeah, I think it's like there's a good chance that America's bull run continues. To be honest, it's not. It's definitely not a um, foregone conclusion. Um, but I think what people have to realize is that like the next, like you're saying, the next period, it's gonna be very volatile, regardless. We may come out on top. We'll just be the the cleanest shirt in a dirty hamper. You know yeah, what I mean? we're the, like we're it's, the best. Yeah, the, the best so, dirty fee out there is out yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> so so I think like you know I'm sure you know like dollar milkshake theory, mm -hmm. right? So like people, there's a flight to safety, um, to the U.S. dollar when when global economy is in recession and whatnot because it's a safe haven still. Um, and there's euro dollar. There's all these systems in place to maintain the, the dominance of U.S. currency, but that's only helpful for other countries with us dollars not people inside america right so it's like the bottom line is like look things are going to get a little hairier they're getting more complicated um people got to keep up and learn and like look into alternatives figure out how things actually work protect themselves um the ai thing like i don't it'll be hard to enforce uh, honestly i don't know how they're going to enforce cording off the the data i think it's so loose and it's not easy to um to kind of like segment that stuff, but who knows, man? Like it's it's all up in the air right now. No, oh, yeah, and there's you know I, I don't know if are you familiar with Noster or any of the decentralized yeah. applications yeah, coming yeah, yeah, out? Yeah. I, I mean, I've I have Noster account. I don't really use it. I know you know some Bitcoiners are probably like, oh, what the fuck, man? But the reason I don't use it is because it's just not as good as Twitter. It yeah, just isn't sure. right. The, the the interface isn't there. Um, but what I am hopeful for for AI and the, kind of this decentralized revolution is that. We can start building software on open source, transparent, sure. you know, tra transparent algorithms. So we understand how how news is being fed into our brains, and we can kind of fight back against that, hopefully. Sure. And Elon's open sourcing his his X algorithms, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 going to be interesting. I mean, so you work, you're in you're in Hollywood area, you're in LA. Um, how do you see AI kind of transforming that industry? I was actually just having a conversation about this earlier this morning with someone. Um, you know, like it's going to, and this is also going to apply to a lot of other shit. It's going to, it's going to streamline and replace people that are doing more menial rote tasks. So it will make you more efficient, but it will not replace a human because it will not replace a human that's doing high level tasks, like high level thinking, high level storytelling. Um, yeah, because it's like, look, you you can you can use AI maybe to like make your assistant's job easier, or maybe even replace them if you're like editing something in post or like doing this or like Photoshop, right? They can autofill the background. There are people that might get paid to do that kind of stuff, and yeah, the AI will fix that. But if you're doing something really complex and really creative, if you're telling a story that requires empathy and like you know like you know human experience, like your brand and that kind of stuff, like an AI can't do that it's never going to be this like it can't relate connect to human on that level yeah. so it's like that's never going to go like just by its nature like like an ai doesn't have a family they didn't they can't have kids they can't they, they don't know what it's like to die and whatever you know so it's like they're not gonna be able to tell that story or make a story that he, relates to human audience as long as the audience is human humans are still going to have a job doing storytelling now will 
it affect the economics of it? 100%. But I think it's like film industry, a lot of industry have gone through a lot of change throughout the years. Anyway. They, they started with silent movies to talky, right? Like I'm like you saw Babylon. That's what the movie was about. Movie. Yeah, right. So it's movie. like there's always going to right. There's that. always going to be changes and 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 evolutions in the industry, and it's up to the people that are in it to adapt, survive, or or move on, do something else. Like it's not. I don't think it's. I'm not concerned personally. I'm paying attention to the different technologies and what's going on, but I do think there's also going to be a lot of red herrings and a lot of like. The, and we talked about this, like I think a lot of this AI tech boom in the last year with the stocks, a lot of it was hyped up. Yes, AI is gonna increase productivity, but there's also a narrative that's being sold and it's being used to prop up the economy, right? And like you saw like the, some of these stocks were just like shooting through the roof in the last year and video went nuts, right? So it's the value, like- Yeah, the valuation at yeah. NVIDIA- And it's overvalued right now. now. Yeah, it's over, so it's gonna have to come down to reality. And that stuff has literally kept the, the market going this past year when Main Street's been suffering, right? So, so I do think like a lot of these things are narrative narratives that are being put out for other purposes. And then you look what happened to Hollywood. They had a strike, right? Mm -hmm. Literally this whole last year, there's a strike. And again, I brought this up before, but like the people that are in Hollywood, they understand macro very well and they know how to manage their cash, cash flow. They know how to manage expectations for the market. They're not stupid. Like these people that run these huge multinational corporations, whether it's in a creative industry or not, they know exactly what's going on. So you look at like the the macro picture, the Fed starts literally um, raising rates end of 2022, right? Or 20, was it 2021? I forget. I keep on forgetting. Uh, I think it was like- 2022, was yeah. 2022, 2022 yeah. yeah. End of 22. And that's when everyone realizes like, okay, the party's over. And then you see the- Hollywood tightening its belt and then they kind of foster the environment for creating a strike because like honestly it's not that hard to do a strike all you have to do is one side of the table has to just not be willing to negotiate when the contract's up the contract's up and then the studio just says we're not going to negotiate let me freeze you out they get a whole year where they don't have to spend anything on on any movies they don't have to release movies in a market that's not going to perform well and they're they're managing expectations they have something to blame on for why the numbers are bad so that when they do come back there's a pop, right? There's stock. They look at the Netflix stock right now. So I think that they did that intentionally. I think that, and then they use AI as a, as a fear so, tactic to kind so, of scare so the creatives. I, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that they might have kind of socially engineered the strike to passively lay off people and push people out of the industry. Yes, they, they, they're coming. trying to cut the, and then they use AI as this like this this uh, boogeyman, which it kind of is for that industry. I think it's I. What I mean, I'm, but have, I think I think some the, of it's no. I, I was I, I do this no. I do trust me. I do it for a living. It's crazy. But I do think some of it is also uh, fear mongering for them to get leverage, um, because like they yeah. understand macro, they understand the market, and they know they know that they can do this. And and if you want a good example, when was the last strike in Hollywood? It was in two thousand six, two thousand seven, which is right before the last recession. So again, like these people are not stupid, and, th and then they shut down during COVID. It's interesting. So it's like you look; their strikes just happen to happen to be perfectly timed before recessions. You know what I mean? Like, and I wouldn't have known that if I didn't get into all this Bitcoin and all this finance stuff. But you see patterns; you start seeing patterns that maybe other people aren't thinking about because people that work in Hollywood don't think about macroeconomics, right? But I'm looking at these patterns, and it's there's too coincidental that the last time there was a recession, Hollywood went went into a strike right before it. They had a good. What was the strike? Was it was it the screen? It was a writer strike. Writer strike. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So okay. and I think the yeah, so so it's like it's like look like these people are not stupid. Um, the people on their boards are not stupid. They know how to, the markets work. They know about monetary policy. That's why they're all rich, and they know how to run their business to where they can turn off the cash flow and like manage their cash. They know how to manage their cash, like the their their debt to income ratio. Like they're not stupid. So it's like my my like my um my theory is that they they time the strike to protect themselves against the downturn and to also manage expectations so that when they come out of it they can get a good pop on their stock and on top of it they use ai as a boogeyman to scare the creatives into you know caving in and stuff and they for the most part the creatives did not cave in and they got fairly good terms but you see the damage that it did a lot of people just left the industry um a lot of people just got screwed financially 
lost their homes, you know, like all the usual thing that happens when there's a strike that long. So it's like, but again, these corporations have huge things of cash. They can always go to the market. They can always issue debt. So it's like, they don't care. They're playing chicken, right? Sure. You're playing chicken with the, with the, with the, the, uh, fucking a Mack truck, right? You're, you're, you're playing chicken with like a, this huge entity that has, they can outlast you and outweigh you. So it's like, it's very tough to, um, deal with that. But that's what I think. I think it's like, look, if you really want to, and that, that's the other thing too. It's like this whole journey with like the Bitcoin and all this other stuff. I don't, I didn't do it because I stopped being creative. I did it to be a better creative. I didn't learn about business so I could stop being an artist. I learned about business so I could be a better artist. And I think like the better you learn these other things, which I never spend any energy on, the better it allows me to do the things I love and protect those things. And just see the world differently. Yeah, exactly. But right? like, like it's like taking off the screen. For sure. But it, but yeah, but that's what I'm saying. It's like it lets me it have the ability to protect myself so I can keep doing what I love and operate in that environment. Because when you're operating in that that level, at a higher level, doing creative stuff, doing any business, um, you got to understand these things. And I think that's that's kind of like the point I was trying to make with the investing in the bull cycle, the the bull cycles and the side. It's like it's not about like do I want to go to Wall Street and become a trader at like Goldman Sachs? No, but I want to be at least close to the level of thinking of someone that does do that, so that he can't screw me. You yeah you, you want know what I mean? Like you want to you want to at least try to stick your finger in the wind and feel yeah where exactly the wind's blowing, and right? that and that's what all the good like the great business people are able to do. Great artists like. Yeah, they just know that it's just like, look, we're 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 out here in the wild, and we need survival skills. And I think Bitcoin is the answer to that. Yeah, for sure. It's 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 no counterparty risk, and there's there's definitely gonna, it's 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 going to be a weird world. And I thought it was interesting when you said that after COVID, because I I know that we're living in a post COVID world. I'm still trying to come to terms with that. I'm you know, I don't, if if you're anything like me, you kind of realize that wait, there's something deeply wrong here especially in the U S and in the Western world. Right. Sure. Um, and so wh like, what is, what is the, and, and this is a big question, sure. you know, what does the next 10 years look like, um, from your perspective, right. Um, geopolitically, or if you want to talk about just the U S just kind of what is in your brain, what Vol are you forecasting? Volatility. Volatility. Okay. Lots of change, lots of volatility. Um, it's going to require a lot of, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, uh, learning, a lot of growth. And you're Restilling. gonna have to keep up. You're gonna have to keep like we all have to keep up. And it's just like it's a hard ask for regular like just people and same thing. I didn't want to learn about the stuff either. But like we don't have a choice. And I think it's like if you take the time to learn about something like Bitcoin, um, it's gonna make your life better and it's gonna allow you to make other people's lives better. And yeah, and it's just like it's like I think a lot of people when things get worse, they're just like, oh, well, like it's the government's fault or like we need to elect a new person, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. It's, it's some other, it's all this stuff. And I think like the, the, what I've come to realize that it's just like follow the money. Right. Yep. So it's like, you have to follow the money. Um, passing some new law, electing some new person is not going to change it. The truth is it like, doesn't matter who you elect either party. They, they're aligned on the important issues. Mm -hmm. Like they're, it's a uniparty, right? Yeah. So like, so this is, it's, it's interesting that you say that because what I try to tell people is look at what, if, if you watch mainstream media, look at what Fox news and CNN agree on. Exactly. They agreed on COVID. Yeah. They agreed so it's on like, the war in Ukraine. Like, so it's like, look, it's, it, the point is that like, no one's going to come and save you. Um, complaining about it is, is not going to save you. Maybe it feels good. Right. But I think it's like, how about. How about you learn to operate in the environment that like, how about you take reality as it is instead of trying to wish for a, a different reality? Sure. You know what I mean? And it's like, and even the labor stuff, like, dude, I love unions. I think they're amazing, especially in history in the past. But like the reality is like, you can go on strike, but once they realize that they're not going to make any money more, they're just, the company's going to go out of business or some other company that doesn't have unions going to come along and just like outprice them or they're going to do a robot, right? Like it's not as, it's not, it's not the way it was in past generations where like that was a viable model and you could just collectively organize. And I just don't think that. And then, and then especially when you know about inflation, you know that the union thing, okay, let's raise minimum wage. What do you, what do you think it's going to do with inflation? Right. Could you think raising minimum wage is going to keep up with, with, and then you say, Oh, the corporations are greedy. Of course they are. But 
they also have the ability to just close their business and go to go somewhere else or like change their business model and just fire all the humans right like so it's just like it's not like it's not going to be able to keep up with the pace of reality and the only way that you're going to be able to do that is if you learn about this stuff yeah and and there is two ways to look at it right because on one side of the coin you have kind of crony capitalism, which is what we're living in right now. Yeah, we're not living in true capitalism. And it's not just, yeah. you know, people like the, the left likes to say, oh, these greedy corporations and the right likes to say the, the big government, but it, it's it's one, one ball yeah, but like, of we're, like, shit. True, this is not, what's going on right now is not real competition, real capitalism. But at like, the same time, as the world, you know, radically transforms into something new, like we saw in the past industrial revolution, this is going to be another industrial revolution. There's going to be massive amounts of, potential for you to make money and capitalize on it, right? 100%, yeah. So there is two ways to look at it, and I'm glad that you brought that up because you have to look at the positive side of things, and you you can't always harp on the negative, even though there's a lot of negative stuff to harp on right now. Um, there is a lot of opportunity. Um, yeah, and that's and you know it's 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 really like are is is a glass half empty or half full? It's really that simple. Yeah, and I think that's why it's like it's important to be willing to go in uncharted territory. Like we like we're about to enter this like kind of wild wild west of technology and of of uh, digital business, whatever, right? Like business, whatever you want to call it. Like there are people making all this money on the internet, doing all this, like it's like stuff's changing very, very fast. So it's like, that's why, yeah, the people that know Bitcoin at the right time really, or some of them are doing very, very well just because they were willing to do the time and the research to like learn about it. And the people that just kind of had blinders on and just kept on doing what they're doing, like a lot of them are not doing well. Some of them are doing fine. Like if you're really good at what you do, Maybe like you're like a doctor, like a heart surgeon, like you probably still do okay. But like, I think the bottom line is like, um, as things continue to the, the pace of acceleration changes on all the stuff, it's going to require more learning from people. And like, that's how I fell into Bitcoin. That's why I learned about finance and monetary policy and all this stuff. And that's why I'm excited about the future of like what I do as a, as a creative, as a filmmaker, because it's like, I'm not going to stop, you know? Yeah, no, no, for sure. And it's, it's definitely going to change. It will, I, I'm kind of curious on how long it's going to take to hyper Bitcoinize, right? If it, if it can't be stopped and if, and if there are no black swans, like you say, because this Bitcoin is something, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's not going to stop. It's very, very difficult to change. That is a feature, not a bug. Sure. And, you know, it's kind of, I, I kind of see it like this defensive weapon that, you can protect yourself against authoritarian regimes, whatever, right? Because like Obama said, ironically, it's like a Swiss bank account in your pocket, sure. meaning that the government can't come into your commercial bank account and garnish your wages or enact a new tax or do anything like that, right? Yeah. And that's going to be this weird shift where we have possible consolidation of large AI models and you know a huge difference in the amount of wealth, right? And the the wealth gap will start to increase. That's why I think it's so important that, and that's why I'm doing this podcast again, is because if you're one of those wage workers, right? And you're near the end or, you know, wherever you're at, you need to own some kind of hard asset that the government cannot confiscate. Because what's going to happen is if we have a large financial crash, I sure. say this all the time, the, <clears throat> the rules are going to change and they're going to change very fast. And the Bitcoin that you hold in that ETF or the stocks that you hold, you know, may, maybe it's maybe capital gains tax doubles, right? Maybe sure. they just confiscate the Bitcoin, right? They did that back in, you know, the uh, 30s for uh, World War One. So that's that's the thing that I'm just trying to urge. And it sounds like you hold your own Bitcoin. Sure. Hopefully most of it. Yeah. yeah. If not all of it. And um, yeah, it's, it's just so important to be self self-sovereign in, in today's world, like you're saying, you kind of yeah. need to, you need to grow up and educate yourself. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like if, if there is going to be a, a government intervention, black swan thing, then like you'd have to just leave the U S you yeah. know what I mean? Like it's not cause you live here or, or go to a red state maybe I, cause, cause I know like Wyoming, um, Florida, Texas, number of other, uh, red states have enacted laws that the government will not be able to confiscate your Bitcoin. Just, well, just you so you know. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. There you go. So, but like the point is like, um, I don't think that's going to happen, right? BlackRock, ETF, all this stuff. Um, but the bottom line is like, there's, it's the best option right now, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, if you look at the landscape, um, it's the most durable, it's the most um, robust system, and like, it's the most 
highest return on your on your on preservation of wealth over over this over the time span of very short time span and like even going back so it's like it's a no-brainer you don't have to put your life savings into it but you can put a little bit right like i think i think what's going to happen is that like as it mainstreams a lot of these funds are going to allocate one to five percent into into whether it's through the etf or even just through holding it Mm -hmm. and a lot of retirement especially these retirement funds you saw what Sailor did. I think he's gonna he's he's been going out trying to trying to um, proselytize and just like you know convert people on in corporate things, family offices, corporate treasuries. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like I think that's gonna be the trend that's gonna lead to hyper Bitcoinization. It's it's probably not gonna be a mania. It's gonna be the slow thing where like people just kind of realize it and then over time, um, it's gonna become accepted because most like most things don't happen overnight. They happen very slow. Same way sometimes they take a long time and sometimes things happen really fast. But I think like if you're talking about hyper, hyper Bitcoinization, it's probably going to take another 10 years. So being devil's advocate, right? Sure. Because I think about different possibilities a lot. Um, there's this guy, I forgot his name. God damn it. He's an Australian finance guy, been around forever, right? Um, has a lot of high net worth clients. Uh, Dunworth, Chris Dunworth? No. His, his his last name's Dunworth. Anyways, he kind of put out this theory like, what if uh, Saudi Arabia or another, you know, cash rich or gold rich nation goes jumps two feet into Bitcoin to get ahead of the game theory process, right? Yeah. And buys all the Bitcoin off exchanges, right? Sure. And you see, you know, this guy Mason, uh, uh, what's his name, Mason Mao. God, I'm embarrassed. Like, anyways, um, sure. he he talks about the Omega candle. Um, Samson Mao, Jesus, yeah, he's yeah, like yeah. one of my favorite Bitcoin yeah, no, guys, no. right? And because he's done a lot of um, kind of orange pilling of nation states, like the Prince Philip of Serbia, and he's been down to El Salvador. He helped in that process along with Costa Rica. You know, been over to the Middle East. Qatar recently came mm-hmm. over to El Salvador to meet with Bukele directly. Um, so it's going to be interesting because what happens is right once a sovereign fund puts their foot or their toe in the water of Bitcoin. If there's a 0.001% chance of Bitcoin succeeding over the next 200 years, it just went up to 0.003 or 0.005. Yeah, I mean, I think it's already right? happening, so once, right? Yeah, it that's, is, but, that's, but that's only going to accelerate, right? For sure. So I'm just, yeah. I'm just curious to see, like, will it be 10 years? Will it be five years? Will it be 50 years? Will there be a black swan and it's going to have to rebuild itself as long as, you know, I think I you, know. Here's the thing. I think you want it to be slow because you don't want someone you want to mass, just... Yeah. Because I think the thing too is like, if you see someone go too full in, that kind of to me raises a red flag because maybe they're trying to manipulate the market and crash it, right? Yeah, the perfect example is what well, Musk did, right, with the with the SNL thing. So it's like you, we, we we've already seen that with FTX. Yeah, you want it to be spread out, right? And I think if you look at what these other countries are doing, um, first of all, El Salvador, they're they're the first one to do this stuff, but and then you talk about what China did and like Russia and stuff, they're doing it through proxies, right? Like they're doing it. Even like, look, Coinbase is like, they kind of pick, every country kind of had picks their golden child to like be yeah, in charge Hong of crypto. Kong, yeah, Singapore. Yeah, yeah right. Stand, yeah. And like, even like in the US, the exchanges, right? Like America basically said, Coinbase, you're the guy. Um, and then this Binance dude got kicked out. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So it's like, you can see that there's already a tacit endorsement of it. It's just done kind of like on the low. Yes. Because they don't want it to be, because A, it's too foreign to a regular person to understand at this point, which is what we're trying to change here. Um, and B, I think if they do it too openly, it shows their cards, right? Yep. So they're all kind of playing poker with each other. They don't want to show their cards. So you want them to play poker as long as as long as they can and keep on putting more chips into the game because that we already have chips, you know? So I think that's that's how I see it playing out. I don't think anyone's going to go full throttle the way Sailor did on a nation state level, um, maybe corporation, but I think the government, I don't, I think the old, the, the way that, the financial system set up it's set up it's run by the old money old system right the bank the fed and all that they're not particularly um you know hot on bitcoin taking off they no. still like their thing but it, it but they may still be tacitly endorsing it as their backup plan right um so that being said they're going to hold on to their current thing as long as they can yeah and that current thing is going to evolve into cbdc's though which scares the shit out of me yeah well that's that's when you start worrying about the black swan about confiscation and all stuff but I, I, even that stuff, I don't think is, if you look at the seed, that that's not going to happen for probably another five, 10 years. Oh, no. I mean, so 
I'll, I'll push back because because I have this website. Um, well, actually, it's on the Human Rights Foundation website. They have a I'll, – I'll, I'll share it with you. It's really cool. It's a globe you can kind of spin around sure. and see where they've introduced a CBDC, where they're working on one, where there's a pilot, yeah, yeah, yeah. and where they're not even – you know, it, it's, it's, well, it's a lot I mean, worse than you think, right? No, no, no. And, I, I've, I've, I definitely like this stuff, but it's also kind of like if you look at here, an, an open CBDC, like the way that it's done in China, they wouldn't – they would not accept that. I don't think so either. So but what they may do is they may just do it – rename it and brand it as something else and also do it on upper level through the banks, right? Because it's already, they already have all your stuff, dude. Like, come on, right? That's true. You're using yeah. credit cards all the time. No one's, they're trying to end cash, right? It's pretty much on its way out. So it's already happening. Um, but the way that it's run in some of those more authoritarian places, I don't think that's going to happen here um, in the near future. Whatever, maybe things change here, but like there's still a very strong culture of, of uh, you know, freedom here. So Yeah, no, yeah, I... I agree, and there's also a number of states that are kind of pushing back against the CBDC. Yeah, so and I don't. Stuff, so. It's going to be branded as something else if they do it, and it's not going to be. The only way I could see it happening is there is a major financial crash. The banks are the bad guys. Remember 08, 09, right? Sure. Very, very fresh in all of our minds, and um, we have a new system, and we're the Fed. And as you've probably seen, the bald guy from I think St. Louis, you know, on 60 Minutes. We can print as much money as we want, sure. right? The average person is ignorant to the fact that that means that um, it's going to be Venezuela in a very short period of time, and China mixed into that with a surveillance state. And by the way, we'll give you five hundred uh, free dollars to yeah, integrate this into your wallet. Yeah. Banks so sign up through it. So, so I'm just I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate, and I, I think and I you, think if you if you just say, oh, we have freedom in America and everything's going to be fine, we can't do that. Right. No, but well, here's the thing. It's like because before you know it, it's no. I mean, that's that's obviously right. That's kind of the beginning of the conversation that we had. But like, I think like if you look at the near term, especially looking at the way they handled this past year, I don't see a seven crash happening. They've managed I don't to either. Yeah. They, they've managed to manage the economy and and pump it up right, doing what they do, and without a huge recession, even though they're fudging everything. Um, they've kept it together, right? Which is for 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 what they do an accomplishment. Um, and then you know that there's going to be happy times leading into the election in 2025. Now past 2025, okay, now we can have another conversation. But I don't think anything's going to break in the next two years. We have to see what happens after that cycle. But we're currently in a cycle, and it's about to head into an upturn. Um, I think so too. So yeah. there's not going to be any social la like disintegration in that time. If anything, things will get better. Um, that's why I say like you look at five to 10 year ranges and, and then, but it, they may just come up with something new to fix it. Like the thing is like, these people are very good at, um, improvising and come up, coming up with the new ways to patch up the system. So th that being said, if you stay in that system, you're getting screwed. Right. But, yeah. but the, the, the bottom line is like, if we forget about COVID other than that, like things have been kept together pretty stable relatively speaking in america at least in the western world um now these other countries right where there's wars going on and there's a lot of instability going on but i do think there's a mode around america just in general right not only literally but like financially as well natural resources we have yeah a ton of natural we just resources. there's a reason why right that america is america so i think like and we are at the end of the day we are still in charge of the financial system globally even militarily again this is all eroding not as a natural progression, but again, those changes will be very subtle and take a long time. And I don't like it's the same way that like people are scared about World War Three with China and all this stuff. Bro, China has got so many problems of their own. They don't want to fight. They're not. Yeah, they're, they're, they're going not, through a financial crisis. Yeah, right they're now. not. They're not. Tr yeah, exactly. Right, and it's worse than ours. So it's like they're not. They're not trying to start World War Three. Will they get Taiwan eventually? Sure, but it's. They, I don't think they're going to invade it. You know what I mean? No, so I, it's I think like, it's going to be a passive takeover. Yeah, and it's going like, to happen in like five years or whatever, yeah, ten years. If it hasn't already happened, the same, right? like look like, the way the same way they got Hong Kong, right? Yeah, it was yep, there was no there was propaganda. no big no. I'm talking about like in the '90s when they just took it back. Oh, there was I know no you're fanfare about recently when they yeah, but there's yeah. no fanfare with like when it got handed back over. So it's like I view it that way. I think like um, things will head in a certain direction and. It's gonna happen. It's gonna be slow moving beast. If you stay on that trajectory, you will you will not have prosperity or your standard living will down. 
that's why we're paying attention to this stuff. That's why we're educating ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so we don't have that decline and we go up and we do better for ourselves. But I, I don't see cataclysm happening here. And I'm crossing my fingers, obviously, right? Um, but I think it's like they they know how to make it look like things are good. Um, the real cataclysm is going to be on an individual level with people that aren't able to keep up because they're going to let the inequality rise. And that's going to be I, – I, and what I was about to say is EBI, right? Like, yeah, right. So it's like – so that's the real and then war. It the, the war that's happening is happening in your bank account and at your job and with your, your retirement. And and if you want to fight back, like that's why you have Bitcoin, you know. Exactly. Yeah, dude. I I think that's a good 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 spot to end it. Actually, hell yeah. Um, well, I'm sure you're already familiar. You're already familiar with these, but I'm gonna give you a 500 Bolivar, nice. sir. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming I'm, on. I'm gonna take this to my aunt and show it to her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good. Yeah, you go. Here, here. I'll, I'll I'll give you a couple. Nice. Yeah. There you go. Thanks. Yeah, man. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Hi, right, brother. Hi, dude.